Welcome to Politics and Prose. Uh, my name is Abby Fenewald. I'm the events assistant here. Um, and this afternoon, I'm so pleased to welcome uh, Tim Wendell to discuss his new book, Down to the Last Pitch. Um, 1991 was a pretty pivotal time in baseball, um, and the game had transformed sort of into the sport as we know it now, but the years of strikes and steroids hadn't yet arrived. Um, and so it seems fitting that in that year, the Braves and the Twins matched up to give us what is arguably the best World Series of all time. Um, so uh, Tim has brilliantly interwoven the defining moments of this seven game series for the ages with stories that give us the context of the time. Um, so you've all surely seen his work elsewhere, including his 10 other books. Is that the right number? Yeah, 10. Um, <laughs> as well as his work as a founding editor of USA Today's Baseball Weekly. Um, and we're so glad that he could join us here this afternoon. So please join me in welcoming him to Politics and Prose. Thank you all for coming out on a beautiful day. Um, one of the things when you kind of do this gig for a while, you kind of go, is a rainy day better? Is a sunny day better? But I guess we're showing that a sunny day can work. Um, also, thanks to Politics and Pros for having me back. Uh, as I've said, you know, uh, in the past, coming here is like playing Carnegie Hall if you're a writer in, in the D.C. area. Um, I want to open with a story I was thinking about. Uh, I've, I've been on the road a lot the last couple of weeks. Uh, book's been out about three weeks. And I was thinking the other night about um, it, in the swirl of the postseason in 91, and either this is, it happened at the Metrodome in Minneapolis or at the um, old Atlanta Fulton County Stadium, both of which have been leveled, and maybe deservedly so. And Roger Angel from New Yorker leaned over to me and asked, What is that song? And Roger and I, when I was just starting the beat, and this is kind of the serendipity sometimes, uh, they never put Roger in the main press box, which I found unbelievable. He was always out in the auxiliary press box for the rest of us flunkies. And here I was, kind of a rookie beat guy, and Roger and I were paired up together, sitting next to each other in 91, part of 92, 93. Of course, we didn't have a postseason in 94, which maybe we'll get to in a little bit. And I could tell he didn't like this song. He didn't like a lot of things, but he didn't like this song. And the song was kind of blaring, and it was part of, that was um, the din of that season was just so much, so much so that I believe in the Metrodome, they ended up taking the bullpen phones off the wall and they had to put them down on the ground, and then the bullpen coach would put a foot on top of the phone because the decibels were so high. The only, re the only way they could tell if there was a call to the bullpen was a vibration coming up through their foot. You also had in Atlanta, of course, the tomahawk chaw, or chop, which made a lot of us deaf at that point in time. And the song that Roger was kind of hinting about, he it went kind of like, da -na 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 -na. hey, da -na -na. Oh, I'm sorry, now you can't get it out of your mind for the rest of the afternoon. And it was one of those rare moments where I knew it. And I don't know if my stock in Roger's eyes went up or down after this, but I said, Mr. Angel, sir, I'm very sure that's Gary Glitter. And the name of the song, I believe, you probably want your fact checkers to check it, but is Rock and Roll Part Two. And he took this down in this clipboard that he had, like he was taking down like the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. And a couple weeks later, um, I showed up in his roundup at the end of the year as my young friend told me that song <laughs> was by Gary Glitter. <laughs> that's back when I was a young friend. <laughs> I also open with that song because Gary Glitter, Roger Angel, it kind of sums up this whole time, I think, a little bit. It seems somewhat fitting for a, a series for the ages, but also a season that, as Abby pointed out, kind of indicates where we've gone in a lot of ways with the game and maybe even where we've gone a little bit as a country. Uh, 1991, it's interesting to look back on something that's less than a quarter century old, but it's a watershed era, and I feel it kind of is. 91 was, in political leadership, the last of the greatest generation handing off to the baby boomers, and as Bill Clinton starts to roll into the White House. 1991, money was not as paramount as it is now within the game. Believe it or not, one of your teams with the highest payroll in 1991 was the Oakland Athletics, with a paltry 35 and change million. And not so foreseeable future, of course, the A's become the poster child for Moneyball, which is pretty much a tacit acknowledgement we can't compete 
in terms of deep pockets or in a sense payroll. We've got to think of a different way to do it. It was also the time where a lot of companies across the country were going in essence from family owned to corporate owned. That was happening certainly within baseball. And part of one of the things that kind of triggered throughout, and one of the first people to pick, the, pick up on this was Joe Torrey, who was then with the Cardinals. There's my nod to the Cardinals there. And um, Joe had pretty much said in an interview I did with him, he said, at this period of time, I started to figure out it didn't matter what I had done. It didn't matter maybe what direction I was moving the team. It was, have you won right now? If not, you're probably going to get fired. There was a record, 14 managers fired in 1991, still the record. And in some ways, I think baseball guys were a lot like maybe we all were at some point with, say, work, the economy, whatever it may be. In essence, if you got in at some place, kept your nose clean, got in at a young age, did a reasonably good job, the company would take care of you. In essence, you'd still be there 30, 40 years, maybe have a pension. Maybe get a gold watch from baseball, maybe have a ring or two. But what baseball guys like Torrey and et cetera started to figure out was this wasn't happening anymore. In essence, it was what have you done right now, which I think has been a major, major sea change. 1991 was also the year Pete Rose is banished from baseball. It's also the year that Roger Maris's single season home run record has the asterisk removed from it for what it was. It's also, as you can see where I'm going a little bit here, that sweet spot before steroids kind of takes over and becomes, in a sense, tarnishes an entire generation. I still kind of root for Maris's mark to still be the mark. Um, it was also, I think one of the good things, and it happened just up the road from here, was you started to see a new wave of ballparks. And this 91 series happens, and we're going to get to it soon, don't worry, I've got a big lead up here. And, um, the Orioles, of course, are racing the finish, Camden Yards, which starts a whole different kind of era in ballparks. Now, one of the most major people, I think, in baseball in the last 25 years is maybe somebody you all haven't heard of a great deal. Janet Marie Smith. Janet Marie Smith is an architect. She is the one the Orioles hire after they saw the first glimpse of the blueprints from HOK for this new ballpark at the Inner Harbor. Those first blueprints, the warehouse is leveled. The surface parking extends out into Federal Hill and across Russell Street. In a sense, they took something that you would see out in the suburbs and were trying to wedge it in to the Inner Harbor. Jana Marie Smith is the one Larry Lucchino hires to push back against that and say, no, maybe we shouldn't level the warehouse, et cetera. Also, up in Baltimore at this point in time, we have the first ball player from a major U.S. sport die of AIDS and that's Alan Wiggins, who is an infielder for the Baltimore Orioles. And one of the kind of mini subplots for down to the last pitch is interviews with his daughter, who now is an accomplished basketball player in the NBA, three-time All-American at Stanford. Um, against this backdrop, one of the greatest World Series of all time happens. It's still the only time we've had worst to first teams go from last place, in a sense, win the pennant, go on to the World Series. And the players caught up in this said it was like being part of like a great novel or movie. Each game kept surpassing each other. Uh, in fact, it's ended up having still one of the best TV ratings of any series ever. And even though technically you've got two small market teams. Atlanta Journal-Constitution went as far as to even have a front page story advising people about sleep deprivation. Staying up too late watching these games. Be careful on the way to work. You don't want to get in an accident. Oh, you know, and those on work accidents could be tough too. Five games decided by one pitch. Four games decided on the last pitch by one run. I'm sorry, five games by one run. Four games decided on the last pitch of the game. Three games decided go to extra innings, including the climactic game seven. You have right now, I think, easily. I think one of the keys to a great World Series is what are the players also on the field? What do they go on to do? You have five individuals, at least, from this World Series who will, in essence, be in the Hall of Fame or already there. Of course, the cover man here, Kirby Puckett, is already in the Hall of Fame. We'll get into that in just a sec. You have two more going in this summer, pitcher Tom Glavin for the Braves and um, manager Bobby Cox. I think John Smoltz is right behind him. 
and Jack Morris, I think, will make it at some point, too. But it's more than just kind of great games. It's great teams and how they kind of rally together and, in essence, how they rose to the occasion. Two quick stories, then we'll kind of open it up here a little bit. Um, the Twins had a lot of sayings. One of them was, everybody has a price. And that's always a good saying to have. It's one of the mottos, and team leader Kirby Puckett was one of the main instigators of this and extended everywhere in the clubhouse. They had, uh, at this point in time, a bat boy uh, called Little Snoop in the Twins clubhouse. The kid had a very impressive afro. You know, afros were big back then. And one day, Puckett offered him 600 bucks to shave the afro. L Little Snoop said no. Puckett didn't like to take a no for an answer, so he started passing the hat inside the clubhouse, Twins Clubhouse. Went to 650, 700, 700, 800, and finally at 825, Little Snoop said, I'll shave my head for that. <laughs> so of course, the instigator in this has been Puckett. He's the one who's got the electric shears, and he's got to take the, and assess the first pass on Little Snoop. And Puckett plays all this up and takes the first one right down the center of the kid's head. And then he kind of pretends that the electric clippers are broken or something's gone wrong. And he's like, oh, gee, so you're, and meanwhile, little Snoop's looking in the mirror that several of the old twins are holding up for him to see. And the mortal words, little Snoop said, my mama's gonna kill me. <laughs> Another great saying the twins had was, don't settle for a walk, go for a knock. Okay, that needs a little bit of a translation. But what it means is don't settle for what's given. In essence, try to do something more. Okay, they may walk you, you may get hit by a pitch, but you know, that's, that's kind of wussy in the, in the old twins way. So in a sense, try swinging for the fences. And in essence, that's the way they often went about things. Now, one of the things I love, and one last story, and then we'll open it up, is um, one reason I love writing these books is teasing out a little bit fact from fiction, legend from reality. The cover of this is after Kirby Puckett has hit a home run that sends the series into a game seven. It went into a game, game six with the Twins down, went three to three in the extra innings. Bottom of the 11th, legend will, have, will tell you, and a lot of people up in Minnesota land still believe this, that Kirby Puckett went up to the plate ready to hit a home run before the game started, he had said, in a sense, jump on my back, boys. I'll take you to game seven. Well, one of the first interviews, and I don't know, I'm speaking for some of the other writers here, but I'm very superstitious on my first couple interviews. I feel like I'm on thin ice. You know, I'm going out. Okay, we've sold a proposal. We're going to move ahead with this. And I start hearing the cracks and such, and, oh, this isn't going to work, and that may not happen. One of the first interviews I did was with Chili Davis. I knew Chile way back when I was first uh, covering baseball out in the Bay Area. And Chile was one of those poor souls who used to play outfield for out in Candlestick Park. I still remember one night we were looking out from the press box and the state flag, the one with the big bear, was blowing straight up out past center field. About 40, 30 yards over, the American flag was blowing straight down. <laughs> and Brett Butler, I remember, was the center fielder that night and we asked him after the game, how are you catching anything out there? And he said, I believe in the power of prayer. <laughs> and I did too, after watching him catch some of those. Chile, of course, had played for the Giants. I knew him a little bit. And one of the things I noticed watching a lot of footage for these games was before Puckett's epic at bat, a lot, there's a lot of conversation between him and arguably his best friend on the team, Chile Davis. Davis was in the on deck circle as Puckett's going up and they are just having an animated conversation. So one of my questions to Chile, of course, is, what were you guys talking about in game six? And I love Chile. Chile gets this kind of wry smile on his face. He goes, you want to know? And I go, I'm here and I'm listening, <laughs> so of course I want to know. And he started to tell me this story that takes legend and puts it on its ear. Puckett did not go up ready to hit a home run. He was actually going up ready to bunt. And he was telling Chili Davis in the on-deck circle, because Charlie Liebrandt's pitching for the, the Braves. Charlie Liebrandt's kind of a soft thrower, change-up kind of guy. Puckett didn't really hit those guys all that well. 
And in essence, he's, uh, he's telling Chili, I'm going to bunt, I'll steal second, and then you hit me home, Chili Dog. And Chili's first reaction, I asked Chili, what'd you think of this great bun idea? And Chili said, I told Kirby, I don't think that's a very good idea. <laughs> so this conversation that they're having is actually Chili Davis arguing, in essence, Kirby Puckett out of bunting. And he does it so well that by the time Kirby Puckett goes up the bag, he's like, yeah, I'm ready to hit a, hit a homer. <laughs> And watching all this from the, still from the on-deck circle is Chili Davis. The first pitch from Charlie Liebrecht comes in knee-high. I've watched the replay of this over and over again, and I don't know, a ball, strike, whatever, it's pretty low. Home plate umpire Ed Montague calls it a strike. Whereupon Chili Davis is going, uh-oh, maybe I gave him the wrong advice, because that was a great pitch to bunt, the one he just let go by. And puck it for really one well, a few times in his career, played things out, was patient. As Puckett starts to watch, he works the count to two to one and then hits it. And I'd like to read just a short, short section from the book and then I'll do an addendum and then we'll open it up for questions. From his vantage point on the, in the on-deck circle, Davis couldn't believe what his friend had pulled off. He had hit the ball hard off Lee Brent. Quote, Puck waited him out. He said more than 20 years later, drumming his fingertips briefly on the clubhouse table and the Oakland A's clubhouse where he is the hitting instructor, this particular bat remained as clear as anything that ever happened to Chili Davis in playing the game of baseball. Lebron puts a ball up in the zone and the next thing I know, Puck hit it. Whether or not it would have enough to clear that plexiglass above the center field fence, that was the only question from where I was watching. That was the only question in my mind. Confident that he hit it hard, but unsure of how far the ball would carry, Puckett took off, running fast as he could out of the batter's box, heading around first base. Thus began a journey around the diamond that many will never forget, and one that the Twins' best player would arguably never recover from. A little bit of, uh, a little bit of an addition. Of course, that ball carries out. In talking with Terry Pendleton from the Braves and some of the other Braves who feel they should have won this series, and I can't disagree with them, um, Pendleton pointed out that in the old Metrodome, which has now been leveled, I was just up there a couple weeks ago, I went by it on their great light rail transit, which runs, which always has me wondering why is the silver line not running yet, but <laughs> that's another whole thing. And I went by and I'm like looking out at this big hole in the ground where they tore down the Metrodome and now building a new stadium for the Vikings getting misty eyed and people next to me are wondering if I'm crazy. But um, in the old Metrodome, as Pendleton pointed out, and I'd noticed it too, were a couple very big air conditioning fans. And when Puckett hit that ball, as Pendleton remembers, those fans were on. They were on pretty high. And as Pendleton pointed out, those fans were never on when I came up to bat. <laughs> anyway, questions on 91 or baseball, where we're going, or whatever you guys want to talk about. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Nothing. Yeah, we'll start with the one Abby and I were talking about with Bryce Harper. <laughs> I don't have a question, but I was at that game. Oh, were you, uh, did you go half deaf too, like I did? <laughs> <laughs> you get all the way through, yes. Mm -hmm. But um, another backstory to that is I was in the suites, uh -huh. and we got a knock on the door, and it was Pat O'Brien and Tommy Lasorda, right. and they said, "Do you have any food?" <laughs> And they walked in, and we started talking to them. And Pat O'Brien said, well, I've got to get back. They're doing some kind of broadcasting. And Tommy Lasorda was saying, telling us all about his mother's uh, spaghetti sauce recipe <laughs> yeah, that, that he's like going to be, you know, <laughs> marketing, I guess. And he's mid, and we're just, you know, conversing. And we're kind of going, this game's going on, but this is kind of odd. <laughs> and um, we hear this kind of crack. And he goes, oh, my gosh. He doesn't even look up. He says, oh, my gosh, what am I doing? That's a home run. Yeah. And it was like slow motion. We all just kind of went like that, and it landed right, and that was the one. Oh, wow. wow. So that was a yeah. – but it's, Kirby it's, also was – the other thing is he was, lived very close to me. And uh, we went into a grocery store, and my nephew had always wanted an autograph from him, and it was like later at night. And I said, well, 
you know, there's nobody in the store. Here's your opportunity. <laughs> and so he just went up to him and said, and his mother said, this is a nice young man. I think you should give him his autograph. So. <laughs> it's funny you bring up the sound of things. I almost read from a section, um, I should still should, how the sound of a well-hit bat sounds a particular way. And it's early on in the book, and how, and I'm actually having a conversation with Frank Robinson during a batting practice, and how he could tell if a ball could carry out simply by the sound. If you go, in a sense, to this particular home run, one reason Puckett's running so fast out of the box, well, he always ran pretty fast anyway, but he, he, he had heard the sound, despite the din, and he wasn't sure. It didn't sound quite, you know, as, as Robinson uh, pointed out, he said, um, in essence, that sound is like you're walking through the woods and you step on a dry branch. It's that you know, crisp break, and Puckett hadn't heard that. So, again, maybe that plays into the fans. See, you missed the Metrodome, too. You, you and I are in the minority, though. <laughs> Go ahead. What do you mean when you say Puckett would never get beyond that at bat, or I'm not sure how you phrased it, but you said Puckett would not get beyond that, that at bat. In essence, one of the things in writing about this, which was difficult to do, is Puckett, in a lot of ways, is a, a rise and fall of an American hero. Um, you know, when he dies tragically, what, of a stroke at, what, 36, 35, he has not been, in essence, um, you know, he's had money problems, he's had woman problems, uh, he has not found a way uh, to stay in the game. You talk to a lot of his old teammates and they really wish, I mean, he, he ended up having to leave the game so quickly in large part because of the glaucoma and the eye situation. And literally, as Brian Harper, who is uh, the Twins catcher, who is a great source, he, he was just a great interview, he said, I've looked back on that a lot. And in essence, Kirby Puckett went to bed one night as one of the best ball players in America and woke up the next day and his career was over. And he was saying, I'm not sure I could have dealt with that any better in a way. And, he, you know, and Harper was saying, and Davis agreed, and Aguilera, a lot of the guys who rallied around him, um, they said, in fact, when we were done playing baseball, we knew we were done. You know, if anything, we probably hung on a little bit too long. Puckett's career ended, in a sense, overnight. And uh, I think a lot of them felt a great deal, not, some guilt, that they hadn't reached out more to him when he was having problems. One of the stories that Dan Gladden told me, uh, another former twin, when Puckett had the stroke in the, in the Phoenix Scottsdale area, Gladden pleaded with the medical people to pretty much keep Puckett on life support almost another day. And at that point in time, Puckett was gone. I mean, he was pretty much close to brain dead. And uh, they did that so more of his ex-teammates could come in and, in essence, say goodbye. You know, as Gladden said, you know, it didn't make any sense to Puckett. I mean, but it made it made the it meant the world to us. One more Puckett story. This is why he's uh, Aguilera tells a great story about, and that was the, the the closer for the Twins. Aguilera came over to the Twins from the Mets. Um, I think I forgot which deal, but and he shows up and um, the Twins are playing at Yankee Stadium, old Yankee Stadium, and he goes down the ramp. He get you know he gets his new uniform on, etc. Um, he really didn't know many people on the Twins, many of the players. And he goes down, and he's standing there in the dugout. And those of you guys that maybe have been there, remember, it's kind of a weird dugout because you kind of come down, and then there was some other steps up. And he's just standing there, and he's got the new uniform on, and nobody has noticed him. And Kirby Puckett's up to bat. There was men on base. He ends up grounding out. He doesn't drive him in. And he's coming off the field really upset. Now, he's not throwing a helmet. He's not doing anything like that. But you could tell he's upset. And he's kind of walking toward the dugout. And he's, you know, I should have driven some of those guys in or whatever. And he looks up, and there's Rick Aguilera. Rick Aguilera and Puckett had never met each other. But 
Puckett knew what Rick Aguilar looked like. And all of a sudden, he gets a smile on his face. He comes down the dugout steps. He gives Aguilar a big hug and says, Aggie, welcome to the Twins. You're going to love playing for this team. And Aguilar's going, I've been here like three minutes, and I'm ready to run through, through a wall for this guy. And that's the way, you know, Puckett was. Go ahead, and then we'll go here. I'm sorry, Richard. No so in game seven, you have Jack Morris doing something uh, that it <laughs> doesn't um, – so I, I was eight years old at the time, um, mm -hmm. and so I assumed watching this that, oh, like, heroic pitchers throw 10 innings in World Series games. That's just what happens. No. Um, was that all, you know, was such a feat already sort of obsolete or, you know, was – was or was Morris's sort of ten inning effort sort of the last great you know horse of the pitching rotation performance? Because I, I just it's unfathomable to think that well, somebody would do that now. Yeah, and because we live in the world of pitch counts and such, um, let's kind of bring some people up to speed. Jack Morris wins Game Seven by pitching ten shutout innings. Uh, for he went well past a hundred um, and. In essence, it was interesting because there was a back and forth, you know, which you, which again is another point of legend, but it does kind of tease out to a certain degree. And the point is that after he finishes the ninth inning, uh, Tom Kelly, the ma the Twins manager, goes to Morris and said, "You've done a great job. You know, it's time to come out. Uh, we've got like Ricky Aguilera. We got other people in the bullpen. We'll try to nail this down." And Jack Morris said, "I'm not coming out." Okay, that's kind of insubordination, but it keeps going. And Brian Harper, the Twins catcher, who kind of teased all this out for me, was actually sitting there, like right next to him as this discussion starts to happen. And Kelly goes, no, 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 it, it's, it's good. You know, you know we'll, we'll take you out. And one of the interesting things I liked about Kelly is Kelly never counted pitches. What he did was keep track of time. Once his pitcher was out there like two hours, two hours, 15 minutes, that's when he would start getting antsy. And he was antsy at this point in time. And, and Kelly says, no, come on, come on, get out of here. Morris's reply is something effective. If you take me out, you'll have to fight me for it, and I'll knock you down, old man, before I go out in the field. <laughs> <laughs> so Kelly kind of goes, hmm. And he kind of goes over and talks to Dick Such a little bit, the pitching coach. And this is one of the great things about Kelly, because he would kind of know when to let go of the reins and just go, whatever. And, um, and he comes back to Morris, who's like waiting now for like the third rebuttal, you know, says, I'm going to take you out and I'm the manager and you don't tell me what to do. And instead, Kelly says something effective, all right, go get him, big guy. It, it's only a game. And at that point, he turned and sat down and everybody's like, oh, okay, it's only a game, let's go. And then they went it in the bottom of the 10. And I think one of the mistakes maybe the Braves made was taking Smoltz out maybe a little bit too early because he was pitching so good. Richard. Hey, Tim. Um, so this is, and we talked about this before, like this World Series is my earliest baseball, my earliest sports memory, it really. It scarred you forever. Yeah, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> um, so yet, yeah, literally now, anytime one of my teams makes to a championship, I'm like, oh, they're going to lose. Whatever. No, no, no. <laughs> um, so you mentioned Smoltz. You expect Smoltz to be in the Hall of Fame, yes. and uh, I do too. Um, a lot of folks put him as one of those guys that's kind of on the line. He gets compared to um, Schilling a lot, who I think, shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and Kimbrell, who's the most dominant say, uh, closer in baseball right now, just broke his right. saves team saves record last year. So right. with the number of wins and number of saves, I don't. there's not really many people in his league. Um, could you talk a little bit about the argument for him in the Hall of Fame and for how Smoltz? soon you think he'll get there? Yes, yeah, Smoltz. I, I think Smoltz will be in simply because, I, and this is my opinion, I've been wrong because I thought Morris would be in by now. But I think a guy who is a consummate not only starter – but also a closer. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for that. And it's kind of funny because one of the things we tease out in this book is we think this when we go to games now, there's this long conga line of bullpen guys. It's lefty, lefty, and righty, <laughs> right? And I'm like, God, I, you know, you about ready to lose your mind. Um, that's so relatively new. And one of the guys who's kind of uh, like a strong secondary character in this is Dennis Eckersley. And Eckersley, I was covering the A's when La Russa and Duncan decided they were going to make him a closer. And he was dead set against it. And I still remember talking with him at one point. He said, the bullpen? I don't want to go to the bullpen. 
I mean, that that's an indication I don't know how to pitch anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and yet later he had to say, yeah, it ended up putting him in the Hall of Fame. So I think one of those guys that can kind of jump back and forth, it's still kind of rarefied air. I mean, we're getting more respect yep. for closers, but people that were able to do both, I mean, you can kind of still count them on one hand. And I know you're, you're scarred by it, but and we've <laughs> talked about this. But I think one thing you got to remember, and this is the, the, the argument that – it's interesting, you can ask yourself of this of any team that you may root on. There's two very, you know, the, the paths, well, I'm trying to do my Robert Frost thing, I can't remember it. <laughs> you know, the paths diverge in the wood type of deal. Off this series, the Twins win. The Twins since then have won three out of 25 playoff games. They haven't come close. Whereas in talking with Lemke, Mark Lemke, uh, Pendleton, a lot of the guys from the Braves team losing this eight in them. And they go on to 13 consecutive playoff appearances. And large part because it started with this. So you got to weigh it. You want the championship or do you want the winning legacy? I don't know. It's pros and cons on both. But uh, in my mind, I'd probably take the championship, but I'm, I'm trying <laughs> to make you feel good. <laughs> what up? Anybody? Boom, 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 boom. Here, go ahead. I was actually also at game six in the second wow. to the last row of the Metrodome, and I am still, my ears are still ringing. Oh, um, my husband, when Charlie Liebrandt came in, knocks me in the side and goes, we can hit this bum! And so it was a very exciting thing, and then, of course, Kirby Bucket did. And um, <laughs> so it was fantastic. Now I'm living in Milwaukee, and so we root for the Brewers, and uh, we have Ryan Braun, yes. and I happen to live a couple miles from Bud Selig, so I see him grocery shopping. And so what I'm curious about is at that time, because now we're seeing pine tar and everything mm -hmm. else, mm -hmm. and Ryan Braun with steroids, what, was there really nothing at that time going on? Is this mm -hmm. really, I mean, it was just all the old-fashioned kind of spit and polish and, the, you know, on the pitches? How is that changing, and then how do you see it continuing? Well, I think it's finally changing, maybe back toward a more even playing field. Certainly you had, in a sense, a, a steroids, to so talk specifically about that, and PEDs, they always starting to flare up. I mean, Canseco was uh, mm -hmm. going to town. He was still, still burning on his uh, glimmer twin there with Mark McGuire and such. Um, so it was starting to come up. But it was interesting in talking with Pendleton, Andy Van Slyke, guys like that, as they felt in 94, because the other thing we haven't quite hit is in 91, but you could start seeing the beginnings of it, was this labor war between the players and the owners. I mean, there really was no trust at all between them. Tom Glavin was the Braves player rep, and I had some conversations with him, and he said, I could see this coming from like several seasons out. I mean, we're going over the cliff, and nobody, in a sense, wanted to do anything reasonable. And the response, especially after that, went much farther than either side wa wanted or calculated. You talk about a game of chicken that really went bad. Um, pretty much the unspoken thing, and Van Slyke told me this, after that it was like all bets are off. In a sense, do anything you want. Mm -hmm. You know, if they can't come together to even save a World Series, they certainly can't come together to get any kind of reasonable amount of testing going on for uh, drugs or whatever it may be. And, it's, uh, and it was too bad, because I think it's really, as I was alluded to earlier, tarnished a whole generational ball player. But what it's done, too, is the great thing about baseball is the history. And it's the numbers that can go back. You know, I can, you know what, put Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron, Roger Maris, I guess, Barry Bonds in a sentence, and you'll know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this, you know, single season home run mark or something mm -hmm. like that. And that's always been the great thing about, um, about baseball. And this is where baseball fails on a couple fronts and goes over the cliff. And it's funny, even going back, and, and it had been a long time coming. In 68, we started to get kind of the first bubbles that how well, in a sense, chemicals could enhance athletic performance. Uh, and I touched on this a little bit with my previous book, Summer of 68. You had two entities, Major League Baseball, International Olympic Committee, both kind of given this new data or they were aware of it. International Olympic Committee's first reaction was, okay, we gotta start figuring out how to test for this and do our best. Major League Baseball kind of went, no, you know, we'll look the other way. Yeah, right here. Hey, 
Um, hey. So hey, but how are you? <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to get your thoughts on this. I mean, it's always seemed to me that baseball, of all the sports, has had the richest legacy of great writing. Just a very, you know, just a, you know, just a real volume of literary, you know, treasure troves. And and I, I wonder what you think about what is it about baseball that has produced that versus other sports, and and what is that body of work meant to you? Well, first of all, the body of work means a lot because I know when I get stuck. I can pull down a lot of things. I can pick up Roger and read him. I can read David Halberstam. I can read uh, you know, one of my favorite baseball novels is The Celebrant by Eric Rolf, uh, Eric Rolf Greenberg. And, and it just kind of reassures me, okay, something can be done. I think it's funny, that question came up about a year ago when I was uh, moderating a panel with um, Jane, Jane Levy who did the Mantle book, the Kofax book, um, Frank DeFord, uh, John Grissom, and I think John answered it the most eloquent. Mm -hmm. He said, in a sense, it's the history, but it's also the fact that you can take things that make up great drama, you know, like, and great drama often breaks down to one-on-ones. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a swirl, it's much more difficult in a way. And so the one-on-ones in baseball are great. It's Charlie Liebrand versus Kirby Puckett. You know, it's Chili Davis talking with Kirby Puckett in the on-deck circle. It's uh, you know, Terry Pendleton hitting the ball that should drive around Lonnie Smith, but Lonnie loses it, and Diane Gladden fakes like he's going to grab it, and Lonnie looks like he's like in the middle of traffic at rush hour type of thing. And, and I think that's, it doesn't make it easier, but it allows you to, to, to do some of the, you know, things you do so well, too, and, uh, and play it out. And, and like, for an instance, like if we had if a pivotal play in the next Super Bowl was somebody ran around right end for 80 yards and wins the game or something, okay, we can write that, but as you and I well know, there's a multitude of people involved in that. You know, the guard probably came out and pulled, and the quarterback did something to kind of freeze the linebacker, and somebody had to cut in on the tight end and blah, blah, blah. And you feel almost guilty not putting them all in and just saying so-and-so ran around right end for 80 yards. And, and in baseball, you can put all those in to a large extent. You can have Lee Branch shaking off, you know, the catcher. You can have, you know, Puckett determined, even though there's been one low strike called, he's going to wait him out, this type of thing. You know, you got Davis having second thoughts going, I've totally given him the wrong advice. And uh, that's it's a lot of fun. But then again, you always say the smaller the ball, the better the writing, too. And some people say <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. You just alluded to it now, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the Lonnie Smith base running error and did <laughs> Knobloch Lonnie. fake him or did he just lose it? Uh, um, yeah. Um, I feel bad for Lonnie at this point in time. Uh, Lonnie Smith should have scored the first run of the game seven. Well, we're eighth inning, right? And uh, he's on first. And Terry Pendleton smoked a double into the gap that – you could have scored us. I mean, you know, I could have climbed on your back. We could have scored. <laughs> and um, Pendleton tells this great story where he's cruised around and, he, and you know, he's just um, feels so good to get this hit. And, um, and he's looking over at Jimmy Williams, the Braves third base coach, ready to give him like an attaboy or just, yeah, we got the run. It's probably going to be the only run in this crazy game. And, uh, and he's looking at Williams and he notices – Lonnie Smith is standing right next to Jimmy Williams. He didn't score. And then Pendleton looks at the mound and sees it's Jack Morris still on the mound and goes, oh, no, you know, we got one crack at this guy. There's a lot of stuff going on in that play. And um, you've got the fake double play, which I think unfairly Tim McCarver on TV says deked out Lonnie. It didn't. You know, if it had, as Lonnie Smith has said, he would have slid in the second if he thought it was a double play. The other thing that's kind of forgotten, I just alluded to it, that Harper, Brian Harper pointed out, is there was another thing of deception going on, and that was Dan Gladden in left field. As that ball's kind of hit, and one thing you got to remember with the old Metrodome, it had a Teflon-colored roof, so balls were lost up there all the time. I remember one time going batting practice, and Chili Davis, you know, we're just, I was like, oh, going, what kind of place is this? And he's there, come with me. And we went down the third base line, and he just said, okay, and people are hitting. Mm -hmm. And he said, follow the ball. I'm losing about every third or fourth one, Chili goes. And, and Davis said, I still do too. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm going, uh oh. <laughs> and, and in a sense, Smith lost it against the Teflon roof. And what Gladden did, which was genius, is Gladden all of a sudden for a minute kind of flashes his glove like he's going to run it down in the gap. And Harper's the one who picked up on that because he said later, they said, there were so many elements of trickery and deception going on, but the best one was Gladden's. And that's the one nobody ever really acknowledged or saw. And he's like running hard and kind of flashes, he's going to catch it. And Lonnie, oh, oh no. <laughs> and then it drops. And oh, poor Lonnie. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, anything else? Sure, here, go up here. Okay. okay. You called this the greatest World Series ever. Yeah, I drew a line did, in the sand. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> that was my question. Were, were there World Series you compared it to? or mm -hmm. uh, And what would those be? What were the top ones you my mind, the top to ones would be 60, Bill Mazurowski beating the Yankees. I think 75 is right up there with uh, the Red Sox and certainly the Reds. And I think one that is already kind of forgotten – um, but it was a memorable World Series is the one right after 9-11, which uh, with the Diamondbacks and the Yankees. I mean, some amazing games. And, and you had this really bone of contention. Did Torrey bring the infield in too far and allow Louis Gonzalez to bloop it over Derek Jeter's head? I don't know. I Maybe mean, you play him halfway, whatever it would be. But, you know, I think anybody, when they're picking their favorites, you got some skin in the game, so to speak. This was the first series I ever really covered. I'd come close two years before. Uh, I got to hang out with people like Roger. It was the first year of Baseball Weekly, which was magical for me. And I think in one of the things that had me thinking about it that way is I still kept, still have the issue from Baseball Weekly that we put out right after that. And the headline read, in essence, best World Series ever? <laughs> and I kind of went, yeah, maybe. So anyway, you guys have been great. Thank you. <laughs>